BP added more than $70 billion to the U.S. economy last year by making investments from coast to coast. Investments like building charging hubs for fleets of electric buses in California and starting up new infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico. It's and, not or. See what doing both means for energy nationwide at bp.com slash investing in America. The stress and crowds of holiday shopping can put a damper on your holiday spirit, and you don't always find all the perfect gifts you're looking for. The Virginia Lottery's games make easy and tremendously fun gifts for all the adults in your life. Even you. Spruce up your gift-giving game this holiday season with the Virginia Lottery. The Virginia Lottery's holiday scratchers are a gift any adult will love. Treat yourself to some winter wonderment and play the Lottery's holiday online instant games from anywhere in Virginia. Visit valottery.com slash holiday. Please gift responsibly. Lottery games are not for minors. Have you heard? You can listen to your gripping investigations ad-free. Good news. With Amazon Music, you have access to the largest catalog of ad-free top podcasts included with your Prime membership. To start listening, download the Amazon Music app or visit amazon.com slash true crime ad free. That's amazon.com slash true crime ad free. And catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of the murder of two girls. Many excellent reporters have done great work covering the Delphi murders, the double homicide of Indiana teenagers Liberty German and Abigail Williams. One such journalist is Susan Hendricks. Susan has anchored for HLN and CNN and spent years digging into unforgettable stories, including crime stories. Back in 2017, when the Delphi murders first happened, Susan began to look into the case for HLN. She spent years spearheading in-depth reporting on the murders, visiting Delphi to interview the families. Now, she's written a book called Down the Hill, My Descent into the Double Murder in Delphi. This book centers both Susan's personal journey covering this case as a reporter, as well as her connection with the families of Abby and Libby. It's a very empathetic chronicle of a truly terrible tragedy. Recently, we got the chance to interview Susan about her book. We have long admired her work. We've been pleased that she continues to offer her thoughts about the case on Court TV. We were very excited to talk to her about her experience with Delphi, the insights she's gotten from the victim's families, law enforcement, and experts, as well as her observations on the future of the case. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Delphi Murders, a conversation with Down the Hill author and journalist Susan Hendricks. We also just add that Richard Allen is absolutely innocent until proven guilty. He's not yet had his day in court. So please keep that in mind when we discuss any hypotheticals about conclusions in this case. Susan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we read your book, Down the Hill, your sort of journey with the Delphi murders. And it was just a really, it was a wonderful book. You know, so much empathy there for the families and kind of taking us through your reporter's journey. And so, yeah, thank you so much. We're really honored to speak with you. It's such a pleasure to be on with the two of you. I know you've been such a a big part in my eyes of the investigative process, considering um, the court documents that were able to come out because 
of what you said, the documents you filed in court with the judge. And I, I know that you've been connected to this case as well. So it's a pleasure to be on with both of you. Awesome. I guess to start off with, can you take us a bit into how you first came to hear about, but then start reporting on the Delphi case in 2017? I do remember I was on set and being an anchor with HLN for more than 15 years. There are so many cases that we cover and so many interviews that I do and on different shows during the day. And for a short time, I was on um, with Anderson Cooper in the evenings. So you do lose track of what particular case is what. But this one stood out to me. I interviewed Ron Logan on his property on our live broadcast. And he said it was a shame. It was soon after the bodies of Abby and Libby were discovered. So I do remember talking to him. And I didn't know because with bookers at CNN, they get the guest maybe that morning, maybe last minute. So while it's hooked up, the producer only has a short time to tell you beforehand. Sometimes, though, if they're booked in advance, you have much longer. This time I didn't. But of course, I knew the basics. It was his property. I knew his name. I knew Abby and Libby were discovered. I knew the day before that they were missing. And then sadly, we heard that their bodies were discovered on his property. So asking the questions that you would want to know, meaning what are your thoughts? Has anything like this happened before? Uh, and he was he was in shock when I interviewed him. So that was the first time I really became connected with this case. I had heard about it. And then once the audio came out and the, of course, first the the shot of the person on the bridge that Libby took on her cell phone, that brought it into a whole new realm for me in terms of picturing what those girls went through, that she was able to record this person and take a snapshot, what we initially thought before the recording and his voice came out. Why do you think it's resonated for all these years with people? I think it resonated because to me, it was the epitome of innocence. Two young girls out at the bridge having fun a day off from school. Friends just wanting to go there, take pictures and have a good time. And no one would ever think. Number one, small town. We've heard that over and over, less than 3,000 people. And you don't really grasp that, I believe, until you're in that town. When I was young, I thought I was from a small town. Not so when going into Delphi. I mean, you really get the sense that people knew each other and there was a a closeness and an innocence that I believe was lost on that day. And the families never, ever, you never do. When you know you see your loved one for the last time, you never know that time has come. But to think that would be the last word that you would have with Abby or Libby Um, I'm just a a day off from school and they never came home. So I think it resonated with a lot of people. You either connected with them yourself, saw yourself in Abby and Libby. I know, Anya, I've heard you speak about it. Anyone in your family that you connect with, it, it breaks your heart to hear the story and hear the details. Absolutely. I think everyone can imagine having someone in their life, you know, some kids want to go take pictures and hang out with a friend and having that be such an innocent experience going so horribly wrong, obviously. Yeah, really early on, you and your team at HLN really took a leadership role in the coverage of this story. Can you talk about that and about how you and your team covered it? Yeah, I do remember the day vividly. So I was in um, Brian Bell's office. He said, Susan, come in. I want to talk to you. We're going to start sending you on more stories because I did a lot. I had been a reporter in California previously. And a couple stories for CNN, I remember there was a flooding, extensive rain in Atlanta. I was live for a couple of shows, but more so I was reporting from the set, if you will. So he said, we're sending you to Delphi. Remember that story with the two young girls? And it had been a year and a half. And I said, oh, yeah. The video, the the audio. Yes, I do know that. I do. And so I'm reading up on it. I, I actually saw the interview I did kind of to refresh my memory on this. Once I was there, landing in Indianapolis, of course, and then going to Delphi, it changed my perspective completely. So that was really the beginning of that. Meeting Kelsey, meeting law enforcement, um, Detective Holman. Did I meet? Superintendent Doug Carter, not at that visit, no. But it's very different to report on a story from behind the comforts of a desk 
it, it really is. Although you're able to connect with guests, even if they're on the set next to you, it's very different than someone welcoming you and allowing you into their homes. And you see pictures of what once was, and they talk openly about an emptiness that's there, the laughter that's not heard. So I think being there really changed everything for me. One central through line of the book, as far as I interpreted it, is just the connection that you were able to forge with Abby and Libby's families. And and you really bring a lot of focus and empathy to what they're going through and sort of talking with them and, and them being at the center of this, you know, very high profile, very heartbreaking homicide. And I suppose you know, how, how were you able to do that? How were you able to sort of get their perspectives, earn that trust um, as a reporter going into this? It changed me as a journalist. And I thought that was something worth sharing and to bring those stories and to bring a different perspective, if you will. I never tried to, not that I could if I tried, but tried to, to solve this crime or you're not going to see any investigative insights in terms of Me. Now I do interview Paul Holes and he's just so on point, of course, because of his skill and because of who he is. But I digress. I wanted to bring the story of what these families go through that maybe we don't talk about on the news. And there are so many crimes and Ted Bundy, Scott Peterson, Jody Arias, Casey Anthony, found not guilty, but it's always about that person, the accused. So what about the families and what happens when the cameras go away and no one's really talking about anymore? Well, the loss is still there and the heartache and the devastation and life is never the same. So I, I went in there and they were so welcoming to me. And of course, they wanted the story told at that point because they needed help as you know, with the investigator saying, we need that tip. They were pleading with the public essentially to say, please watch this. Please know who Libby is. Please know who Abby is. Remember this story. Because at times when there were rumors, and as you both know, of someone that may have been connected through the years, because think about it, it was close to six years before there finally was an arrest. There were names that would pop up and rumors that oh, finally, maybe it's this person. And I remember Mike Patty saying to me, Libby's grandfather, Susan, I'm not going down, going through this again. It's a roller coaster going down that hole, thinking that getting my hopes up, maybe it is him. And he said, especially it's damaging if the news outlets are putting it out there. Um, He wasn't blaming the news outlets, but saying, if that is the rumor, then some people in passing may think that it's solved and maybe they'll stop looking. Because at that point, At any point in this investigation, they didn't know if the person was even in the state. So they needed all the help that they can get. And that was reiterated through law enforcement saying, we need you, even if you think that this tip won't be helpful, please call it in or email us. And it could be. Um, So that was something which is why they welcomed the media. And I felt connected to them. Without even really thinking about it, it almost happened organically. I just felt a closeness and um, it, it's hard to even explain. But it, again, it changed me as a journalist for the better. It changed me as a mom, as a person in a good way. And I feel like I'll be close to them forever. One thing I'm curious about is that you mentioned, you know, you covered this story as it was breaking as an ongoing thing. You, you've amassed a great deal of knowledge and information. And so how do you take all of that and then write a book? How do you gain that perspective? Well, Kevin, being an attorney, I know you know this, but if if I could picture a case when I decided I, I, I wanted to write this and I looked through, I had in my room papers in my desk at work, just stacks of it, notes that I had taken. I remember which stands out to me the most during this story was the April 22nd press conference, 2019. I'm sitting there on the floor, on the rug in the front row, when the superintendent said, we're changing direction, we're on to you. We believe you have lived in Delphi or you still live in Delphi or worked here and we believe you could be in this room. I mean, right after that, I recorded that part. It's still on my cell phone now you hear kind of paperwork going like this because people started to write notes and it's like, what? So then I was live on CNN from that minute for another six hours, every probably 20 minutes 
then the next morning up at 6 a.m. live all day, meaning the different shows. So I might be on the noon show, the one show, the 2 p.m. Oh, you know, Poppy Harlow wants to hit up 3 p.m. You're going to be talking to this anchor, that anchor, because it was so unbelievable to say, what do you mean you think he's in this room? I mean, if it was a movie, I don't know if you'd believe it when you heard it to be in there. So then I'm looking around and one of the photojournalists with CNN, if if you go to a certain location, and this was, I believe, my second or third time in Delphi, whatever photojournalist is there at the time, because they get called to breaking news all the time. So this group came from Chicago and it was their first time there. And he tapped me on the shoulder and said, in this room, because I gave him the backstory a little bit of what was going on and what had happened in the prior years. And then we were live from that room for two hours. Everyone cleared out very quickly. I mean, everyone. So I'm there with a producer, with the camera, with the two photojournalists, and that's it. Once the two hours special was over, I thought, oh, this is a little weird because no one was in the room. It was kind of frightening. And I said it to the photojournalist, I'm kind of scared. He said, don't worry, but in war zones, you're fine. So it, it was kind of a, we both laughed. I thought, okay, well, this is, because I didn't know, was had he been in the room or where was everyone? I thought there'd be an arrest within hours, maybe days, but as you both know, it didn't happen. There was so much surreal about that press conference. We weren't covering it back then, but just looking back, I know that was a moment that sticks in a lot of people's minds is like a moment of hope, but also definitely confusion. Mm -hmm. And my father being an attorney throughout would call me, and I'm sure this has happened to both of you, where people want to know why it's not solved. Like we would know, what do you mean? They have a picture on the bridge and they can't, why is it not solved? And I said, I don't know. I mean, that's what that was. There was an interest in that aspect of it. And I think that law enforcement who have been criticized throughout and they were doing the best they could. They wanted it solved as well. And I believe that Superintendent Doug Carter had a difficult job of of kind of holding the media, keeping everyone at bay, having to communicate with the family members who were saying, okay, it, it, Becky said this to me, you know, Libby gave us the video. We owe her an arrest, Mike had said as well. I mean, Abby and Libby were gone and it had been more than five years and there was still no arrest. And throughout every holiday, every birthday, every Christmas, every milestone that they were missing was another heartbreak for them. And to have no one in custody, not to say, and we do know someone is in custody, innocent till proven guilty, that doesn't erase, that doesn't make everything better. But at least you feel like, okay, maybe justice will be served. Because when they had no one in custody, there were no suspects that they spoke of it felt kind of hopeless for them. At the murder sheet, we spend so much time digging into crime stories that sometimes it's difficult to find the time to plan out and cook elaborate, nutritious meals. That's why we are so excited about our sponsor, Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. Our sponsors make this podcast possible. So if you go to factormeals.com slash msheet and use our special code, M sheet. You're not just getting half off this high quality meal plan. You're supporting us too. So I'm obsessed with Factor. I had their creamed corn chicken and their tomato basil chicken risotto recently. Both were delicious. That risotto in particular was amazing. Plus, the whole process was a breeze. All I had to do was pop the meal into the microwave. The food was tasty and flavorful, which is no surprise given that each recipe is specifically crafted by chefs and approved by dietitians. Having Factor during the hectic holiday season has been a boon, especially with us pumping out so many episodes. Head to factormeals.com slash msheet and use code msheet to get 50% off. That's code msheet at factormeals.com slash msheet to get 50% off. Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of mystery and thriller titles and originals, like Something Ain't Right by Roger Stringer and Zachary Stringer. 
The Space Within by Greg O'Connor and Josh Fagan, and the Audible original, Moriarty. Membership includes access to Audible originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere. Whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500. That's audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, FDA approved for over 20 years. So talk to your specialist to see if Botox Cosmetic is right for you. For full prescribing information, including boxed warning, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. Remember to ask for Botox Cosmetic by name. To see for yourself and learn more, visit BotoxCosmetic.com. That's BotoxCosmetic.com. You talked about that moment of the press conference seeming like something out of a movie. <laughs> There's another moment in the book that kind of jumped out at me as being a little bit like something out of a movie. And that's when you're with your producer, Barbara, and Ron Logan appears in front of you and says, they ruined my life. Yeah. Oh, can, my gosh. Can you talk about that and about Logan. Yeah, it stands out to me because, as you know, because you were there, when you see it, when you see the picture that Libby took, that still shot of the man on the bridge with the big puffy jacket, you... At first, and especially when you see him take a few steps in the video that she took, you, my thought, at least, was that the bridge was maybe, I don't know, 10 feet high. I, I didn't really think about it. But when I first approached the bridge and got there, it was a completely different experience. Even getting from where we parked to the bridge, it felt... And maybe because I had known what happened there, it felt eerie, it felt dark, it felt isolated, it felt secluded. Um, but again, you know, when you think about their ages, they didn't think of that. They grew up there. That was just a fun place to go, a fun place to escape. But my experience was that it felt very isolating and um, it was freezing the day I went. We always talk about how warm it was for that area when Abby and Libby were down there and it was a sunny day. But when I did, it was, I believe it started 19. At one point it got down to 10. So I had hand warmers in my gloves and in my boots. And it was Barbara, myself, uh, two photojournalists down there. And uh, we had a drone shot. Oh, and Kelsey was with us as well. Mike asked her right before if she was comfortable going down there with us. She said yes. And we were near the bridge and she spots because her and Libby would go geocaching and, and she found something that Libby had left for her and we were talking about it. And I just thought initially, she's so mature beyond her years. Um, Kelsey, I, I just, my heart goes out to her. She's so strong without wanting to be or needing to be, but she has to be. She all of a sudden overnight became an advocate for her sister. So once we were walking back uh, to go back to Kelsey's house, Kelsey had left, so it was Barbara and I, and all of a sudden it, it felt like he appeared out of nowhere, and it was Ron Logan, and he he walked up to us. He didn't say hello, or he just came up to us and said, the police, they ruined my life. They arrested me. Someone came in and stole everything in my house. They ruined my life, and I, I looked at him again. We were freezing, and I, I said, well... Why? And he said, I don't know. And I asked him if he had a son, maybe, because I was trying to say, well, could it, it click then that I had interviewed him on the set? And then I thought, does he have a son? Could it be anyone around him? And and at that point, I didn't know anything, but I knew that he was angry. And then year, a years later, a couple of years later, I figured out why. Yeah, he'd been he'd been looked at pretty hard. And then, you know, there remains suspicion from some corners on him. One thing that we've noticed about this case that's interesting and, you know, kind of speaks to the online interest is that you do have people who are kind of focused on a specific suspect or they kind of theorize there was because it was unsolved for so long. There's almost like a can we all figure this out together, which is good in some ways because the interest remains. 
but maybe bad in some ways because this, you know, can kind of get into crazy speculation or, you know, disrespect towards the families and, and just kind of kind of get out of control. And I guess, you know, as you were reporting on this, how did the sort of social media element of it all kind of factor in? Was that something you were watching? And, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's weird because it endures to this day, even though there has been an arrest. I think it was an outcome that law enforcement didn't see coming. Maybe no one predicted where it could go. The perfect storm, if you will, of getting everyone involved, pleading with them to call in. All they needed was that one tip. And if they know something, they could help solve this crime. I believe their words were, um, Abby and Libby deserve this. You could help them. So I think that people, there are people out there who really wanted to help. And then there were people who took the opportunity to look through everything in the town. Maybe they got a hold of yearbooks and they would put side by sides of the original sketch or the one that was first released that we saw. So I believe that it turned into this sort of witch hunt for a suspect that took over and law enforcement tried to kind of reel it in saying, look, you're ruining people's lives. And then it went, it it, it was out of control when they started to suggest that maybe family members knew something they didn't. There were conspiracy theories. It It snowballed into this bizarre, bizarre kind of underworld of people saying they know and accusatory remarks about law enforcement. It just got ridiculous. It was something I had never seen or experienced in any story that I did. And for the book, I interviewed Deanna Thompson of, you could bleep this out, but don't blank with (laughs) with cats, that documentary on Netflix. And she got involved with with that case. She was looking for a particular person online that was seen killing cats. It was Luca Magnata. And she got involved with that, she said, kind of organically. She had another job, never wanted to do this full time or become an investigator. And she was explaining to me, she gave me real insight about how this can happen and how there are people out there who genuinely want to help. Like we saw in the Gabby Petito case, that someone spotted the van and and knew where she was and TikTok was helping. But it can turn toxic very quickly. And especially when you alienate family members who are already who are already going through so much. Yeah, no, I thought I thought, I mean, the family, the families in this case have all handled the situation with an incredible amount of grace and, Mm -hmm. you know, eloquence. And given that they're grieving, I think that is that is incredible. And they've been such advocates for these girls. And when people turn on them in an online space it just is kind of like you know I feel like the lack of empathy is like well how would you know (laughs) if you were in this situation how would you feel if then suddenly people were coming after you for you know perceived just online nonsense it just I always become incoherent because it just makes me mad (laughs) me too and it's it's I didn't even know that that was possible but as you both I'm sure have noticed they usually don't show their faces during those posts or the people who do do that. But it's just so hurtful to the people involved, right? Like they're not already going through so much. And and one thing um, you mentioned with, with Deanna, you also mentioned Paul Holes, um, reading the book, you know, Dr. Ann Burgess, you know, you yes. were able to call upon so many experts to sort of enrich your understanding of the book. And, and you know, tell us a bit about that, how you went about seeking out those other opinions as you're sort of trying to piece together a larger understanding of what happened here? Well, it was February 2019 when I met Mike and Becky for the first time. And Mike had said to me, it was in their kitchen, look, we go to something, it's called Crime Con. And I must have had a face, a look in my eye. He said, no, it's not like what you're thinking. No one dresses up. This is, we get the word out about the girls. A lot of people go and We'd like you to host the panel if you you wouldn't mind. I said, sure, I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, He said it was Indianapolis when they first went. So right near them, ironically, it just so happened to be right near them. And uh, he said it it was helpful. And so I looked into that and hosted the panel in New Orleans 2019 and met a lot of really, really wonderful people, people who had been victim of crimes, crime advocates, those who were there to see how they can help. Maybe they had family members 
who knew someone who was also a victim of a crime, really a supportive group. And Paul Holes was there. He had been there for several years uh, doing panels, talking about Golden State Killer. And I had met so many people through there. And Kevin Balf, who started that with his brother years before, introduced me to Deanna. And I met Paul through his work at HLN. And I had met him briefly there at CrimeCon as well. So to get the insight of people especially knowing Paul and Anne and what they had been through and Paul's expertise. Talking to him, I learned so much because it made me realize his thought process. And he, like so many people before, once he was at the location, he changed his mind significantly and he was able to assess kind of the area and think about what type of person would do this, why they would do it, Will they do it again and how quickly? And uh, it appears just from what he told me in the book that a lot of what he was saying may be the truth. We talked a little bit about how you found out about this case and got drawn into it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious, can you talk about where you were and how you found out about the arrest of Richard Allen? Oh, yeah. So... Uh, a friend of mine, Dan, who I done work with on the podcast, and I, him and I are close, and he texted me and just said, suspect in custody. That's it. And I knew right away what it was, because in the past, he would say, they're looking into this guy. And I, oh, God, who now? What guy? I don't know. Because I had always thought, I'll wait for Mike to text me, or then I'll, because if it was another guy, maybe just that the internet liked. So in my mind, I, I said, in custody, this was different because someone was actually arrested. Beforehand, there were rumors and, oh, this person was arrested for this particular crime, maybe connected with the murders of Abby and Libby. So this was different. I was in my car picking up dry cleaning on a Friday and thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. Then I saw a picture of who was in custody and I I just started, I, I couldn't, help but look and look at his face and say, is this him, the guy that everyone had been looking for for close to six years? Is this the person on the bridge that Libby took a picture of? And just the more information that came out, the more shocking it was for me. Where were you guys when you heard? Oh, man, we got a tip a few days prior to the announcement. And it was one of those weird experiences where, you know, we didn't want to report anything to endanger people you know like right like, we just it was like one of those like hot potato like just like uh we right, love you don't it. know what to do with the information yeah. right 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 we ended up kind of deciding you know what it's not worth a scoop you know like it, yeah if we're wrong and right. if uh it could be endangering to law enforcement or people around this person or the person themselves we kind of just we kind of punted on that. And then um, when we came into, we, we drove up to Gel- Delphi that Friday and we're, you know, all the news crews are going around trying to figure out information. It was just surreal. And we were just like, when we saw Becky, uh, like social media posts about like yes. 10 a day, it was just like, wow. It's surreal. I know after so much time and uh, there was a lot of criticism with law enforcement, and understandably so, because a lot of people were thinking you have so much evidence, even Superintendent Carter admitting that on several occasions, saying, I've never had this much evidence ever in any particular crime that I've covered. So everyone was asking the question is what's taking so long. But now you understand that why they held back the evidence that they had. There were criticisms connected to what they were releasing and what they weren't. But now that we hear that the unspent bullet played a significant role in the arrest, you understand why they didn't give that tidbit of information, because maybe that person who's in custody would have gotten rid of that particular gun. So you never know exactly the reasoning behind law enforcement. And he has said on several occasions, one day you'll understand everything that we know. So having kind of blind faith in law enforcement was difficult, I know, for the family members too. They weren't told either. Now you kind of understand, and it's not really our place as citizens to say what they should release and why they have to. We just wanted to give the information, at least people who called in tips, 
but they also wanted something in exchange from law enforcement, something more, right? So that day was epic because everyone was thinking, finally, close to six years, finally, someone's in custody. But Paul Holes did mention to the the families, he was on stage with me at CrimeCon in Las Vegas, and he he did mention, it was 2022, look, once someone is in custody, because they weren't at the time, it's a long process as well. The judicial process is long. So it's not, there's not, there's an exhale maybe that someone's in custody, but that's really just the beginning of that particular stage. Absolutely. And and actually that brings to mind, uh, segues nicely into my question, which is just, you know, as you're following the Richard Allen case, it's proceeding slowly for sure. I know there's allegedly going to be a trial in January. I think we're all a bit skeptical about the timing at this point. But, you know, what sort of things are standing out to you or, you know, as you're observing this, what comes to mind for you that's interesting? Initially, I thought, oh, my gosh, he was hiding in plain sight. He was. He was working at CVS. He was there. He obviously saw family members. He was in the town when there was you know, pictures of Abby and Libby everywhere the whole time. And he had a daughter. That was shocking to me about that he was really right there. Um, many questions about how someone is capable, of course, of doing this. Had he done it before? So many questions. And then wondering once he wrote that letter pleading with the court system saying, I'm at your mercy. I need representation. I didn't realize how expensive it would be. So seeing that letter and I, I was wondering, of course, he didn't say he didn't do it. Maybe there wasn't a place for him to not say that. And then he was assigned the attorneys and wondering how they would proceed with the case. He, They said he was not guilty. And then, of course, when the three of us were all on court TV talking about the documents that had come out that he had confessed. So then it takes you in a whole different direction. But initially I thought, oh, my gosh, this it's been this long and he was right there. I know for us, it was like, you know, and it kind of, it sort of it underscores some of the, you know, the limitations of, of, of journalism, of investigations of true crime interest, because nobody had ever mentioned this name to us ever before, whether it's on the online sleuth sides or people who are maybe more officially connected. It was just someone out of the blue. And it kind of was like, it was shocking at the time because we'd all heard of Ron Logan. We'd all heard of Kick and Klein, like people who were you know, linked publicly. And then there's this person who was working at the CVS right there. We all drove past that CVS, I'm sure, dozens of times. And what was mind blowing to me was just that, like, you know, it, it oftentimes we just don't know what we don't know. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think a reminder for everyone to have space for that of like, it could just be something we're not considering. And maybe that's you know, something to look at as well. And I think that's mo the most frightening aspect for me is that when we hear about what happened, we hear some details about a horrific crime and we expect this person to look like a monster and they never do. They never look like we think they're going to look. They just look normal. Could it be your neighbor? Yes. We've seen that time and time again. And I got to know Carrie Rawson, BTK's daughter, very well through the years, meeting her at CrimeCon initially and doing a panel with her. And she said, I had no idea. This was my father who drove me to college, who made me scrambled eggs in the morning, who who would tell me to don't forget to fill up your tires, make sure they're not flat. And he was a mass murderer and, and she didn't know. So someone with that psychosis who was able to do this and compartmentalize is deathly frightening for me, any mother, any, you just, you panic to think there is no warning sign on their head. They don't look a specific way. They don't act a specific way. They can blend in. And that's what's frightening. Absolutely. Um, one thing your book does really well, and it is because, you know, the on the ground reporting that you've done over the years and really getting a sense of place with Carroll County and Delphi in particular, you know, I mean, this is a crime that is absolutely, in our view, affected the community out there. Um, you know, the the posters hung up for years. Mm -hmm. People continue to to follow the case. And for you, what does what does this you know possible you know break in the case? And you know, obviously, Richard Allen is innocent until proven guilty. But mm -hmm. um, if if there is ultimately a conviction here, 
what do you think that will mean for the wider community? It, that is a good question. It does make you wonder about maybe the the trust in law enforcement. I don't know. I I don't know. I, I feel like everyone is waiting to hear, maybe to fill in the blanks from Superintendent Carter. And of course, they wanted the outcome that we all wanted. And I do remember Doug Carter saying um, several pro- profound things to me and in the media that he just, he feels horribly. He thinks about Abby and Libby every day. He he wants to be able to tell this family what they want to hear, that someone is in custody. I believe the investigative process, they tried their best. But if there is no connection, if this is just random, if maybe Richard Allen went down there because he had killing on his mind, but it was just the right opportunity for him to get away with this, then it's hard for law enforcement to connect that person who's not in the system, who we don't know how much DNA they had, who wasn't there. It's hard to pinpoint that particular person with no priors. It, that That is a difficult thing to do. And I know they had the help of the FBI. We don't know how much help or what they were allowed to see or how much they were involved in the investigation. I do know they were there. And I also do want to point out they were very close to Kelsey, the detectives. And she would always post on Twitter saying, look, this is not the particular person I'm talking throughout the investigation. Like, please stop posting this. I'll let you know if I hear something. Uh, And she said a line that stood out to me saying, It is someone, but it can't be everyone, meaning it's not every person who's been arrested in the vicinity or who has a prior. So she had the responsibility, sadly, of kind of being the voice for the detectives, but also being the voice for her family and keeping everyone who wants to help at bay and not saying, not finger pointing that this is the particular person. So the overall picture of what this means for Delphi and really what this means for law enforcement, I believe we'll see in the um, the process moving forward. It'll be interesting, and I'd like to get your take on this. Do you think there will be a trial? Do you think that there may be some sort of settlement? I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's actually something Kevin and I talk about amongst ourselves quite a bit sometimes. You know, will this go to trial? Is there going to be ultimately a plea? Uh, will something else happen? You know, I mean, uh, there's kind of so many different possibilities. Um, mm-hmm. I think both of us hope that there will be a trial just from the perspective of, I would love for the public to get to see our process working properly. And yeah. you know, here's his defense. They're coming out very hard, you know, saying he is innocent. And here's the prosecution making a profound case based on law enforcement's investigation. And we're seeing both sides really have their day in court. And then a jury of his peers are making a decision ba- based on that. Um, at the same time, given how draining and emotionally turbulent a trial can be for the family members. I'm, su- I mean, I suppose, I guess it would be a kinder situation for them if there was a guilty plea at some point. But we don't know. Yeah, I mean, this every time we try to predict something, in space, it's just like no, <laughs> that the opposite happens or, or something. You know, so we're just kind of we're just gonna be monitoring it and seeing what's happening. And of course, the defense attorneys have maintained that he's factually innocent, and they say mm-hmm. these confessions aren't really confessions they're just kind of wild almost incoherent and inconsistent statements so it'll be curious and that makes me you know so many of us have so many questions about this case Mm -hmm. do you think that the legal process will answer those questions for all of us i hope so i think that for law enforcement for indiana state police for the detectives i believe their heart was in the right place but the amount of or the lack of information. I I felt like the secrecy maybe facilitated more rumors or more speculation. And then, uh, I don't know, it had people questioning, is this the right guy? Is it not? And then all of a sudden we, we heard that that there were confessions, um, not just once, uh, five or six times. So we'll see. There's so many unanswered questions. You're right. You can't even predict what's going to happen next because we just don't know, but it will be interesting. The timeline moving forward, is that enough time? Again, close to six years and think about the discovery process and everything involved for for the attorneys. Because early on, I remember hearing one of his attorneys speak saying, look, I'm just getting the information today. 
he wasn't privy to all the information. He didn't know much and was saying that. This was early on, day week one or two, that he had met Richard Allen. So it will be interesting to see. But Paul Holes had told me um, throughout and working with the Golden State Killers fam- victim's family members, he's an advocate for them and helps guide them through the litigation process, was with them then and then in the aftermath. And he did say to me, look, there are tactics you can do. He has every right to fire his attorneys. Then it's another couple of years. I mean, you never know what tactics could be done to prolong this. I I hope it's the easiest outcome, if you will, for lack of a better word, for the family members. And hopefully they they have a say if it comes to that. I know you have um, done some episodes on the judge and, and kind of getting I've listened to those. And it's really enlightening kind of what type of judge she is. Her empathy, what she cares about, seems to be very fair. So it'll be interesting to see. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. Um, We got the sense she's very much regarded as a very fair judge in Indiana. And, you know, I certainly think that that they were, you know, the Indiana Supreme Court was thinking about that as they're selecting somebody to essentially oversee a very, very important case that has so many eyes on it. Um, One thing we try to stress to our listeners is that, this investigation is, as you said, you know, it's six years of work, multiple suspects or multiple persons of interest or different avenues that went down. Ultimately, the prosecution is going to be focused on Richard Allen. So I feel like we probably won't necessarily have everything cleared up just by trial alone or saying, oh, here's what that was when we were doing this. Um, but I think, you know, we're just hopeful that there are answers and that the process is just as easy for the families as well. They've been through so much. A trial is obviously going to bring about intense media scrutiny throughout. So it's just, yeah, it's it's just complicated. One thing I'm interested about is we've talked a little bit about law enforcement and you've seen the side of these guys that maybe a lot of people haven't seen. I think at one point you described Jerry Holman as being a little bit like a a big brother. So I'm just wondering, what are these guys uh, like when you talk to them in private? And, you know, kind of funny too, kind of jabbing me like, oh, maybe I'll talk to you. Maybe I won't. Joking around and having to talk to the media and doing a lot of interviews and he and being a father, you could tell that he has a good heart and, and Tobe Lesenby as well. They wanted to solve it. It kept them up at night. This was personal for all of the law enforcement involved in this. I know it. I felt it. I saw it. But I I got to know them as people and just people who want justice for Abby and Livy as everyone in the town did. Everyone did. And they did the best they could with the information they have, with what came out of asking the public for their help. The tips, 70 plus thousand. Maybe that was too much in hindsight. How can I say that? I don't know. I mean, maybe one of the tips led them to Richard Allen if he is guilty. Again, we don't know exactly. And of course, it's never a bad thing to ask the public for help and for a tip. That's not what I'm saying was bad. It was the amount of information. And remember, they said there was a lost file. So were they overwhelmed with the tips, I guess, is what I'm wondering. And what was the filing system like? And when certain law enforcement agencies are allowed in, do they have access to all of it? Because when you hear file, you think of back to the Mad Men era and the 80 of a filing cabinet and pulling out a drawer. But was it or was it computerized? We don't know. So a misplaced file to me sounds very um, odd. Uh, so I think that information will come out, too. I think that's what stands out to me the most. It's like, wait a minute, this guy came forward right away? right away. And I I remember uh, Superintendent Carter saying time and time again, look, if nothing happens, we're going back to the beginning. We're starting over again. And it appears that's what they did. And that's what possibly led to Richard Allen. Or was it a tip that we just don't know about right now? Was it someone that called in that knew him? I don't know. But something obviously changed and he was nowhere on the radar, as you mentioned. Oh, yeah, there was absolutely a a seismic shift, if you will, um, from summer of 22 to fall of 22. And, you know, kind of we're I mean, and and you probably felt this too. kind of having sources, you're kind of like, okay, what what is happening here? And then October and you're mind blowing. Um, 
I mean, one, one thing I wanted to ask you about is that, you know, you, you've been so invested in this case and immersed in it. What are some misconceptions about this case or, or just sort of anything, um, you know, surrounding the case that y- you think it's important for people to understand, you know, or the reality is a bit different than, you know, what you might think or things like that? Maybe misconceptions about knowing the area. I read different posts or different blogs or watching YouTube channels of just who these people are and what they must be thinking. You know, they were just regular happy girls in eighth grade. It it just, and fun and funny. And I've heard stories about Libby and I, I saw the post she would send Tara, her aunt, and just, she was very funny. She would log on as Tara and say, I love Libby the most. I mean, you really got a sense of who she was in the house. It was, this destroyed these people's lives, the fam destroyed. They will never be the same. So maybe, I guess, not a misconception, but maybe it's lost on them about how much the family has suffered, really. I think instead of so much of who's doing everything wrong and who did everything wrong, how about just empathy and sympathy with this family who has to think about for so many years finding this person. And now if it is him, if he is in custody, what I did learn is that it's not the elation that you think you'll feel when someone is in custody. Becky had always said to me throughout so many times we've talked on and off camera that I can't wait, Susan, I'm going to come to Atlanta, I'll scream from the rooftops. And there was just kind of a, a, a defeat, a lost look in her eyes that I saw, especially after the hearing, the meeting, if you will, the announcement where the prosecutor said, look, there may be other actors in this. McClellan was saying that, but someone is in custody. And uh, Becky said, I thought I'd feel very different. I don't have a purpose anymore. And that was heartbreaking to hear. And Mike, of course, being the person who's saying, look, we have a different purpose right now. Now it's about what more information you know and how we can help the prosecutor if he needs it from us. So always kind of saying, okay, the family had become a support system for law enforcement too, kind of the middleman, if you will, between maybe someone who has information about this guy now in custody who could help with the trial because it's not over yet. It's really not. Yeah. Yeah, well said. And, you know, I mean, they have done such a good job, too, I think, kind of speaking to other victims' families and like, here's what can happen if you find yourself at the center of a very high profile case or, you know, what to look out for, offering that guidance to others. Abby's grandmother, um, Diane, said that, that while they were building the park, the Abby and Libby Memorial Park, that she had met those who wanted to help, who wanted to pitch in. And also, she said that she felt that way at CrimeCon to have people come up to her. And she said, Susan, it's a look in their eyes when they tell me I know what they know. It's Mm -hmm. unspoken. They just kind of connect in that way, knowing the loss. You can't even explain it. Because I've said to Kelsey, I I can't imagine how you feel. That's the truth. I don't know how she feels. I really don't. You could try to understand it. She said, Susan, the people who really do have lost someone, have felt that deep, dark heartache. And Diane said that, that crime kind of has helped them. And I believe overall, it's a connection to say, you're not alone. It's not just you. You can get through this. This is how I got through it. And through that, Diane said, look, if if anything, if I can help, I didn't think that I could. If I can help someone else, that helps her as well. One thing that you you talked about a bit earlier that I wanted to kind of circle back to is just how this reporting on this case has changed you as a reporter and just as a person. Um, if you can expand upon that and sort of share that journey with us. I, I got very good at compartmentalizing and everything in my life to a, maybe a detriment, but being in the news business and covering these stories and starting out as a reporter in the field and you interview families and I've interviewed um, so many. There was a gentleman who stands out who lost their son in a hazing incident, a- and he was sitting on set next to me with tears in his eyes. And you take that in, and you hear their stories, and it's it's horrific. It's horrible to hear the loss, to see the loss. And then that news cycle is done, and you go home. And then the next day, you interview someone else. And the next day, it's something else in the headline. And for a period of time, you can follow something for several weeks, then it goes away. 
with this when I was there. I think that had a profound effect on me being there in their homes, seeing where they lived before the 13th, where they were running out of the house. Um, Abby on the 12th going to Libby's house. She would never go back there and, and seeing her cat and seeing where she lived. That had a profound effect on me. And also, I think the most was the family being able to, ke- to keep moving on, being able to laugh, being able to find the strength to keep going for Libby. Because they had been honest with me, especially Kelsey, saying, look, I didn't want to go on anymore. But I was able to meet people and I knew that Libby would want me to. So you have to keep going. So I found that I found inspiration in the in the family members saying, wow, you know, when you think something's bad in your life that you can't get through, you can. So that's how it changed me the most. Like, okay, the next day when I'm on set covering another story, this is a family. This affects the entire family forever. The cameras go away, but the heartache and the aftermath, it's still there. And they also do want to be treated normally. So if someone feels uncomfortable, and I saw it firsthand, I saw it happen. People come up, they feel awkward, and they go very fast in a group setting. They don't know what to say, so they say nothing. I'm not saying I'm a pro at this. It is difficult. But when you really get to know people, it's just something that's horrible. It happened to them. You can talk to them about it. They're okay to talk about it. And it changes family to family. But they know they want to be able to keep going for Libby. And they even go to vacation spots still to this day that she would love to go to. They always keep her in mind and say, look, we feel like she's still with us. She wanted to go to Chicago one year. So they went and they all sat around a table and they put a picture of Libby there. And I know that Becky said to me, look, Susan, she'd always, she was adventurous on any vacation. And she said, come on, grandma, try it. You could do it. You could do it. So in Austin, when CrimeCon was there, Becky said on stage that got a laugh. Look, I rode on a scooter today. I'd never have. I was scared, but I knew Libby would want me to. And everyone laughed. So it's kind of continuing to go on. It's not really what happened on the 13th to them. And we still don't know, obviously, because that part of it is sealed, but they want the public to know more about Abby and Libby before that. How had they lived so many years before that particular day? The memory they want to be, not the crime, but who they were before. That's all very well said. Uh, Before we wrap up, uh, you've done such a great job with this book that's just now being released. Uh, I always uh, like to ask, are, are you working on anything else that people should be uh, keeping an eye out for? Yeah, keeping my sanity. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I digress. No, that was good. Oh, my gosh. But I, I will say I, I thought. I'm glad that I wrote this. I really am. And I'm proud of what I wrote. And I hope that the family is proud on how I wanted the reader to understand more about who Abby and Libby were and their family members through the stories that they had told me. So I, I hope I do make them proud. And that's my focus right now. It's about talking about Abby and Libby and um, the family members. And I hope uh, I made them proud because that's what I wanted to do in writing this. We want to thank Susan for speaking with us. We really appreciated her insights. We'll include a link to Down the Hill in our show notes, but you can find it wherever you buy books. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet. 
and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet Discussion Group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. The number one selling product of its kind with over 20 years of research and innovation. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, is a prescription medicine used to temporarily make moderate to severe frown lines, crow's feet, and forehead lines look better in adults. Effects of Botox Cosmetic may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious symptoms. Alert your doctor right away as difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness may be a sign of a life-threatening condition. Patients with these conditions before injection are at highest risk. Don't receive Botox Cosmetic if you have a skin infection. Side effects may include allergic reactions, injection site pain, headache, eyebrow and eyelid drooping, and eyelid swelling. Allergic reactions can include rash, welts, asthma symptoms, and dizziness. Tell your doctor about medical history, muscle or nerve conditions including ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, or Lambert-Eaton syndrome and medications, including botulinum toxins, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. For full safety information, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. See for yourself at BotoxCosmetic.com.